All right, welcome back everyone to my round six recap from the Reykjavik Open. So I actually played this game yesterday and as you're gonna see, it was a long, stressful game for me. And I was really exhausted afterwards and I just had no energy to do the recap. So doing it now when I'm still kind of tired, but at least I have some energy. So hopefully I can get through this without falling asleep or stumbling on my words. And it was a, a really like instructive and interesting game and a lot of rich ideas, which I'll try and cover. So I was playing against Lohia Soham or Soham Lohia, uh, rated 2081. And as we're going to see, I'm pretty sure my opponent was like very underrated, at least uh, the way he played this game. Uh, so I started with a London opening after e6, bishop f4. Um, the reason why I played knight f3 was I didn't want to encounter bishop f4 d6, uh, which I thought he was capable of playing because he has played king's indian in the past. So I thought knight f3 is kind of a tricky move order because if d6 and I have other options of not putting the bishop on f4, but rather playing c4 and uh, knight c3. So I played bishop f4 and he plays pawn to b6. And I looked at this a uh, little bit before the game. I did see that he uh, has played Queen's Indian in the past, and this is the start of a Queen's Indian setup. And generally, I'm happy to play against these setups when I play the London, because uh, there's some cool ideas. After e3, bishop to b7, and then pawn c4. This is not the traditional way of playing the London. Usually, white puts a pawn on c3, uh, going for the more triangle setup. But c4 is a bit more of an ambitious move, and there's some interesting ideas here. Uh, for one, if black plays c5, which looks very standard, then white has a very strong move, d5. And then there's a cool line, takes, knight c3, and if takes, there is knight b5. And um, yeah, when I uh, actually, when I was lecturing at the St. Louis Chess Club, this is years ago, back in 2017, I gave a whole lecture on how to play the London opening and how to beat good players with the London opening. And the first game I showed in that lecture was a game from this line where I had beaten Fabiano Caruana in an online game, at least supposedly Fabiano. It was like an anonymous account, but pretty sure it was Fabiano. And I had won in like, I think within five more moves from this position. Um, I'm not sure if this is exact position I had against Fabiano, but the idea is after knight a6 defending c7, white can take. And if d5, there's very strong move queen a5. Uh, so there's a lot of venom in this line if black's not careful and white's completely winning in this position. So. This is just a bit of opening inspiration, but my opponent played, um, a, I guess, a more solid move, bishop to b4. And here I played knight f to d2, which looks a little bit strange at first. Uh, you might wonder why I'm not developing my undeveloped knight from b1, but there's some, uh, some nuances where there's cases where the knight likes to go to c3, and if I play knight c3 immediately, black can um, induce double pawns, which I don't quite want. And knight fd2 also has a benefit of unleashing the queen, and there are certain lines where the queen can come to the king's side pretty quickly. Uh, so after castle, a3, bishop e7, knight c3. I've had this position once in a tournament game before, and there's another kind of cool trap from this line, which I should show because it's just more inspiration to play such a, a line for white. If black plays c5 here, which I had, oh, I forget what year it was. I think it was like 2017 or 2018. No, it was 2016 or 2017. So at the Pan Am Collegiate Tournament against GM Injic, he played this move. And there's really nice response to play d5. And it's another thematic pawn sacrifice except white's not really sacking a pawn because we can win it back after takes, takes. Um, if knight takes, there's queen f3 immediately with the pin. Injic took with the bishop, and after takes, takes, queen f3. This has been played before. It's actually uh, uh, an opening line that's known to be good for white. After knight c7, uh, I don't want to take and take the rook because my queen gets trapped in the end after knight c6, but very strong move queen b7. And... Um, yeah, this is this would have all been opening preparation, uh, but my opponent avoided all of this, and rather than playing pawn c5, uh, he played pawn d5, 
which is opting for a more kind of Queen's Gambit decline setup. Uh, this is a very typical setup for Black against the Queen's Gambit. And I think d5 is probably the best move. And it's a move that I should have been more prepared for, but I'll admit that I was out of like specific preparation at this point, but I knew general ideas, like I knew opening principles that I should develop my bishop and castle. So I started with taking, we trade on d5, I play bishop d3, pawn c5, I bring my knight to f3, and after knight d7, I castle, and I thought, okay, it seems to be like a very fine setup, still resembles a London, uh, we have this tension between the pawns. Now it turns out that castling may have been a slight inaccuracy because I just underestimated Black's next move, which he played, is pawn to c4. And generally, I don't mind seeing this uh, in a queen's gambit decline structure because after bishop to c2, um, there's no more pressure on d4, and I thought that, uh, at least early on in the game, I thought that I'll have ideas of knight e5 and attacking on the king side. But uh, it turns out that black has equally, if not greater, pressure on the queen side. After this move pawn to b5, there's already ideas of storming down with a5 and b4. And I think at this point, like after he played b5, I was realizing that the position actually isn't so easy to play for white. Uh, I started with the move rookie one. After I played this move, I just regretted it, especially after he played a5, because I realized my rook doesn't have a great purpose on e1. And this may have been caused by just the fatigue. Uh, this was my second round of the day. Earlier in the day, I played Anna Kramling. And then after my game with Anna, we analyzed on her stream for uh, like 60 to 90 minutes. So it was just kind of a nonstop day for me and uh, kind of showed with my moves, like playing, playing a move that didn't really have a clear purpose, especially because white almost never wants to play e4, uh, allowing the bishop to breathe more fire along the long diagonal. E4 would also weaken my, uh, my d-pawn, which I don't want. So after a5, I opted for knight e5, and then we traded, and I took with the pawn, trying to imbalance things. I mean, I'm, I'm playing someone who is about 300 points lower rated, and I thought that if I'm going to try and win the game, I might as well um, make the position a bit more imbalanced. Um, and what this does, even though it doubles my pawns, it opens up the file for my queen. And I had seen that after he plays queen d7, I can put my queen on d4 and then try and play against this uh, kind of backwards d-pawn on the half-open file. But he played well here. He started with rook c8, uh, preparing bishop c5. I drop back to g3, so I unleash the fourth rank for my queen. He plays pawn b4. I play queen f4. He plays pawn g6, which is a very... Uh, Nice prophylactic move, if you notice in this position. I was threatening bishop f5, so g6 simply prevents that. Now, I still wanted to get this bishop to do something, because currently it's just staring at this pawn chain. So I was happy with my next move, is to play bishop to d1, which sets up the same skewer idea, now threatening bishop g4. But it also has ideas of bringing the bishop to f3, where it would just be a more active square to challenge the long diagonal. And uh, then he played another prophylactic move, pawn h5, so preventing my bishop from winning material. I play bishop h4 here, offering the trade. He takes, I take, and then he plays pawn to c3. And at this point, I realized there's actually like a lot to worry about for white, because this, uh, especially the c-pawn, is becoming more and more dangerous, and I can't allow black to play c2 and b3 and a4 and just have this pawn chain all up in my territory. So uh, here I decide to take, and after takes, I put the rook on c1. And I wanted to create a situation where this pawn is more of a weakness than a strength. And pretty much for the rest of the game, the strategy for both sides revolves around the c-pawn. Because black is constantly trying to not only defend it, but make it uh, a weapon. And I'm trying to just blockade it and uh, eventually try and win it and, and treat it as a weakness. So it was a very interesting kind of strategy from here. Uh, he started with rook c4, hitting my queen. I play queen g5. Now I'm aligning with the king, pinning the pawn, so I'm threatening bishop h5, but he simply plays queen d8, offering the queen trade. And at this point, I don't really have a choice other than to take it. 
Uh, I didn't want to play queen h6. I thought that was going in a little bit too deep. So I took on d8. He takes back. And I'm just realizing I lost internet connection. So maybe I'll take a brief pause and wait for the internet to come back. Let me get some water too. Shout out to Icelandic water. It's very fresh. I don't know if it's mountain water or lake water, snow water. Maybe melted snow. Okay, my internet just completely died. Oh, it's back. Okay, good timing. I have to stay hydrated though. Okay, so what was I saying? Oh yeah, we traded queens, and now it's a rook and bishop ending, but very imbalanced. Uh, like pawns are kind of scattered. Uh, there's multiple potential pawn weaknesses for both sides. But as we're gonna see over the next few moves, bishop b3, rook c5, rook d1, bishop c6. Uh, black is pretty much in full control. Like it's actually very difficult for me to target anything in the position. Like the move I wanted to play, did I play it? No, I played bishop c2 here. I wanted to play rook d3 and hit the pawn, uh, but there was a problem with this move. What was I scared of? Yeah, my brain is kind of mashed potatoes at this point. What was I scared of? Why didn't I just go after the pawn? Take, take. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is actually an instructive moment that black doesn't really have a great way to defend the pawn. But black has a way to counterattack and uh, really clamp down with the move rook b8. And yeah, the reason why I didn't go for this is because if I take the pawn, takes, takes, there's back rank issues. Uh, mainly bishop a4, I believe. And then if I take, uh, rook b1 comes with mate. And if I play bishop a2, then rook b2 comes. And my bishop's essentially trapped because it's tied down to defending the back rank mate. So yeah, life was kind of sad. If I can't play rook to d3 and rook b8 is coming, I um, yeah, I just kind of accepted the fact that I have to play passively. And I'm pretty sure after I played bishop c2, I offered a draw. I have a score sheet somewhere. Uh, is this the score sheet? That's not the score sheet. Uh, for the last few games, I've been playing on the non-DGT boards just the normal boards with plastic pieces. So my games have not been broadcast live and I've had to take notation and manually enter the moves afterwards. Um, of course, every game I have to take notation, but uh, somewhere on my score sheet, I did mark that I offered a draw and my opponent thought for a little bit and declined and he played on, like even though he's much low rated, um, maybe me offering a draw uh, was communicating to him that I think I'm in trouble, which I did think I was in a little bit of trouble. And he correctly played rook b8, and now uh, things became very unpleasant. I play rook b1, he plays rook to b2, and it looks like I'm about to get smushed on the queen side with black controlling so much space. And now if I take the rook, he would take back, hit the bishop, and if I move the bishop, there's rook c1, and this is pretty much game over. I guess I have rook f1, but then bishop b5, and oh no, my position. So thankfully that didn't happen. I found a, a better defensive move here, played rook c1, and after bishop b5, I realized that the position is like barely held together. My rook on b1 is defended, my bishop's defended, the pawn is blockaded, and I'm not immediately losing this or this, which are both potentially weak pawns. So I figured that there's still some fighting chances here. I played the move pawn h4. Uh, he plays bishop c4, which is a great way to improve the bishop. I play pawn a4, and I was just trying to hold my own and not, uh, not lose a pawn. Now, I was reluctant to play pawn to a4 because it fixes a pawn on the light square, but I figured that it's a bit safer there because it's always defended by the bishop. And um, what was the other reason? Oh yeah, so I also play a4 because I was scared of rook b5. I thought this was one of the ways for black to make progress and pawn a4 takes away the b5 square. So he continues, plays bishop a2. I can't take his rook, I have to move to a1. And now it looks like all the pieces are just stuck. Uh, my, my rook on a1 has no squares. My rook on c1 is tied down to the bishop and my bishop has barely any moves. And then he plays king f8. And at this point, I thought I'm just going down because I'm almost in Zuzwan, and I just have to kind of wait on the king side. 
I start with king f1. He brings his king in. He attacks my pawn on e5. The only way to defend it is to play pawn f4. Then he plays bishop c4 check. I play king f3. He plays bishop to b3. And it's actually an interesting position here because even though I'm a little bit stuck, it's not so clear how black makes meaningful progress uh, just because the rooks can't really improve further. And there's many cases where, uh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, there's cases where like if black tries to do anything with this rook, then I might have bishop d1 hitting the pawn. And um, yeah, it's just hard to make progress for black. So the reason why he played bishop b3 is to try and transform the position in some way where he can keep making progress. And uh, I guess another idea of this move is once my bishop's removed, his king can come in even further. And there's dreams for black of eventually putting me in Zugzwang where I have to retreat my king, and then his king comes very deep into the position. And um, yeah, when he played bishop b3, I, I still was not happy. Uh, I had to take, he took back, and I play rook to a2. Um, now, I was happy to find this move because if I don't have rook a2, I didn't really see another great alternative for me. Initially, I wanted to play rook c2, but this runs into rook b2. And in cases where it takes, takes rook b1, rook c2, this is just easily winning for black because my rook is completely passive. If I ever move it, there's rook c1. And this is actually a great example of white being in Zugzwang, let's say pawn g3, king f5. Every single legal move for white would be self-destructive. Like you can try and find a move, but yeah, white's going down one way or another here. So I was happy with rook a2, because if he tries the same idea, rook b2, there's actually a really funny tactic for white here, which keeps me alive. And this is actually a great puzzle for viewers. If you want to try and find the move, feel free to pause the video. Uh, but the move is to create a situation where both of my rooks are hanging. Move is rook takes c3. And even though both of my rooks are hanging, both of black's rooks are hanging. So rooks are very confusing creatures sometimes. They enjoy partaking in staring contests. And in this case, I would just win a pawn because black can only take one hanging rook at a time and then I would take the other rook. So yeah, I was happy uh, to at least be surviving here because rook b2 seemed like the only way for black to keep advancing uh, on the queen side. But he plays king f5, and I'm still like almost in Zugzwang. I play pawn g3, and he plays rook c4, and I still have to kind of hold my ground. And it seems like my rook has to stay defending the pawn, but instead of keeping my pawn defended, I play rook c2, creating pressure against the c-pawn. And uh, I'm offering the pawn trade, which of course he doesn't take. But if he does take on a4, I would be happy to simplify. And I was dreaming of maybe playing for a win in this position with eventual checkmate on f6. But none of that happened. Uh, he did not take on a4. He instead played rook c6. I moved back to a2. And then he did something very tricky. He played rook to c5. And it's a really tricky move because he's essentially triangulating. Like he's trying to lose a tempo. And if I play rook c2 here, he would play rook c4. And this is the exact same position we just had, but it's white to move. And I'm pretty sure this is lost for white because I'm in Zugzwang again. If I move either rook, um, rook b2 is coming. Either rook move along either the first or second rank, for example, rook a2, he would then have rook b2, and my same tricky rook tactic doesn't work because this rook is defended by the pawn from d5. So uh, yeah, I think this this would be losing for white if, uh, if I return to c2 here. So once he played rook c5, I saw his evil intentions, and instead of walking into Zugzwang, I didn't have to commit to c2 because he, he's not attacking a4, so I don't have to counter pressure the c3 pawn. Instead, of, I basically play a waiting move, rook e2. And then what ends up happening is he plays rook c4, I play rook c2, and we've repeated the position twice now. We've had this position for a second time. He went back to c6, I go back to a2, 
He goes to c5. I play rook e2. And um, I should note that uh, you can see here, his time was getting very low. At this point, he had 4 minutes and 20 seconds left. And he was basically taking the rest of his time trying to find some way to push forward. It was very clear from his body language that he, he wanted to beat me. But he got to, at some point, below 3 minutes. And then he... Okay, he did not play C2. There was a mistake on the broadcast. Wait, did I say that this game wasn't live broadcast? I lied. This game was uh, was live broadcast. It was my next game that wasn't live broadcast. Sorry about that, because we do have timestamps here. And there was a mistake at the end. He did not play C2. I'm pretty sure he played Rook C6 and offered a draw, which I was very happy to accept. Um, so the game did end in a draw. And the crazy thing is, if we turn on the engine towards the end, the Stockfish says that Black is like nearly winning here. Um, like minus two. At some point earlier, it's close to minus four. But the winning plan is not so simple. And I'm actually really curious if Stockfish misevaluates. Like it'll say minus two, but I'm not sure if it will get better for Black. And I haven't had a chance to like fully analyze this in depth um, just because it's it's been a very tough schedule. So this will be some homework for me after the tournament to study this rook ending and maybe find the truth if Black can actually win this. Uh, one thing I didn't note that if, if Black plays f6 ever, I can take, take in g4 and this would be some progress for me on the king side. But maybe there's lines where the king can kind of walk into the queen side, uh, maybe even walk to b4. Uh, may have involved Black taking some risk to try and win the position, but um, I was very fortunate to have drawn this game, and I think my opponent just played a, a very nice game, like understood the early middle game position better than me, uh, especially with this pawn c4 move. His opening preparation, I think, was just better. Like He, he neutralized my London and then uh, very quickly just got the edge. So I think I'm very fortunate to survive this game, given that I was just nearly lost in the endgame, nearly zugzwanged, almost completely frozen. Um, I might title this video Frozen Rosen. I'll try and do some fun Photoshop with the thumbnail. But anyway, um, I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm recording this right before midnight. I still have one more game to play. Uh, I'm recording this after my round eight game. Round nine's tomorrow. So I hope you enjoy the video. If you have questions, leave them below. I really appreciate the comments and feedback, and especially those who subscribe and like. So anyway, uh, I'm out. Time to sleep. I'll see you guys soon.